Good morning, friends. On behalf of uh, organizer Professor Brahma Singh and uh, VSHF Foundation, not for profit organization, I invite you all to today's uh, lecture. Uh, I also wish to thank to Nipa, who is sponsoring this uh, webinar series. And uh, uh, today's uh, speaker, Professor Pitam Chandraji, who will be talking on future of protected uh, cultivation, has had his uh, graduation from Pantanagar University, Agriculture University, and master's from University of uh, Manitoba, Canada. He has had his uh, doctorate from Cornell University. Professor Chandra has been director of uh, Center Institute of Agriculture Engineering, Bhopal. He had been professor of food engineering at uh, NIFTEM Kundli. And uh, uh, he had been ADG at ICR headquarter also. Professor Chandra has had uh, uh, various uh, uh, positions in different uh, organizations. His contribution mainly had been towards uh, the greenhouse technologies, especially the sector of uh, low cost greenhouse technology for India, electrical pollinator, evaporative cooling, pipe bending machine, greenhouse management, greenhouse as solar dryer, microcontroller for uh, greenhouse management, package of uh, vegetable cultivation under greenhouses, fabrication and establishment of plastics, glazed greenhouses, analysis of radiation exchange in greenhouses, establishment of uh, national phytodrome facilities. Uh, beside greenhouse technology, he has uh, made significant contribution in agriculture and food processing in the sector of micro microwave drying and uh, MW assisted osmo convective drying. And uh, in seed packaging, modified atmosphere packaging, finite element based simulation models, finite difference based simulation models, gadget for wind measurement, pressure drop, and heat transfer in rock beds, grounded for grader. Dr. Chandraji has done a lot of teaching work in various courses related to engineering and has guided two MSc students, five uh, masters in technologies and uh, six uh, for doctorate. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chandraji has a uh, lot of national and international assignments, uh, especially uh, skill gap assignment uh, in uh, assessment in farm mechanization in India, establishment of a center of uh, excellence on farm mechanization in India, impact assessment of submission on agricultural mechanization in India, greenhouse design for NPCC Bhutan uh, under FAO program, uh, sub-regional uh, workshops on food quality and safety, status of protected cultivation in UAE, study of post-harvest uh, processing of dates and pomegranates in Egypt, study of agriculture uh, mechanization in Bulgaria. Uh, Dr. Chandra has uh, uh, contributed in uh, books and book chapters and reports. There are a lot of uh, uh, reports and books and book chapters to his credit that he has uh, had. And uh, he has had international exposure to various countries in various programs, as indicated. Uh, for, for example, Canada, USA, Australia, Italy, UAE, Egypt, uh, Germany, China, Thailand, Bhutan and Pakistan. Uh, based on his uh, lot of contribution uh, to the uh, system, Dr. Chandraji has been uh, awarded with various fellowships, especially in the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences of New Delhi. And uh, he has uh, had eminent engineer award from Institution of Engineers, 
I am the team award of Indian Society of Agriculture Engineers, New Delhi. Uh, he has had AICTE Hindi Book Award and most uh, prominent Rafi Kamid, uh, Ahmed Kidwai Award he has to his credit. Uh, as also, uh, as also, he has had to his credit Lady Davis Fellowships uh, and Fellow of Indian Society of Agriculture Engineers and Fellow of Institution of uh, Engineers uh, India. So, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, appreciation, with uh, from the point of view of uh, fellowship of different organizations and uh, the awards from different uh, uh, sectors, uh, based on the contribution that Professor. Chandraji has made, uh, he has been recognized uh, in this sector uh, very much, and he has a lot of experience uh, in protected cultivation, uh, as has been indicated in his biodata. So, I uh, not taking much time between the uh, viewers and uh, the uh, speaker. I would invite Dr. Chandraji to take the floor and uh, deliver his talk on future of uh, protected cultivation in India. Professor Chandraji, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalia, for a very generous introduction. Let me start my screen uh, so that I can save time. Yes, sir. Am I visible now? Just a minute. Yeah. Yes, it's coming. Very good. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Brahm Singh and the foundation for inviting me for talk today. And as you can see, the topic is future of protected cultivation. Now, why do you think that I should, I would be able to do justice to this topic? Some of these things have been indicated by Dr. Kalia by way of introduction, very generous introduction. But I'll share a couple of things with you uh, to convince you that, uh, well, I have the background and the uh, know-how to look into the future of protected cultivation. In fact, in 1974, when I went to Canada for my master's program, I was supposed to be studying green, uh, grain storage because that's what the University of Manitoba is known for. But uh, when I was there and my professor, he took me to a greenhouse in October that year. In September, I had lived there. In October, it started snowing and he took me to this greenhouse on the campus where tomato, cucumber and capsicum being raised and they were being harvested, neatly packed. And so it was quite an experience that uh, nothing is going outside, but within this structure, we can grow very successful crops. So I naturally got interested. And then my professor said, if you are interested, you can work in this area. Because he had a grant to work in the area of greenhouse energy conservation. And that's how I moved away from grain storage and got into the business of protected cultivation. So this is one thing, but then after completing my master's, I had no in interest in pursuing this uh, greenhouse technology any further. But as the destiny would have it, my admission at Cornell also brought me close to the greenhouse technology because they had a funded scheme from Department of Energy to design solar greenhouses. And then to, I went to North Carolina State University for my postdoctoral fellowship again. That was a project on uh, solar greenhouses. And then I said, okay, this, this may be the end. In 1980, I came back to India and never thought that uh, I would ever work in this area. But again, 
I was working in Junagar and there was uh, untimely rain during the month of uh, October, spoiling the harvested groundnut crop in the field. So again, the idea occurred to me that why can't we have a protected structure to let the crop dry without the ill effects of the rain. And that's how the first ever wooden frame greenhouse came up on the campus of the Gujarat Agriculture University, Junagar. And um, of course, uh, it was quite a success. And then we thought of uh, extending it further, but then the director research there was not interested. Well, subsequently I came to CIA Bhopal and there Dr. Oja, who was my director, he was member of the National Committee on the Use of Plastics in Agriculture, a government of India body headed by Dr. G. V. K. Rao, who was then the uh, chairman of this committee. And earlier to that, he was the member planning commission. And Dr. Oja asked me that since you have had background in greenhouse technology, I should continue working. So that's how I have been putting all my eggs in the basket of greenhouse technology till 2003 when I joined the ICAR as Assistant Director General. So with this long association with greenhouse technology and the related um, protected cultivation practices like greenhouses, low tunnels, I have had long exposure and I feel that um, that gives me the authority to talk about the present future of the protected cultivation. Uh, let me take you to some of the reasonings why I feel future of protected cultivation is very safe and bright. As they say, economists say that since the fundamentals are strong, our economy should be growing. Similarly, I would like to say that since fundamentals are strong, the future of protected cultivation is bright. If you look at the traditional agriculture or what we call open feed agriculture, it involves the intensive use of local and indigenous knowledge, traditional tools, natural resources and organic fertilizers. I remember uh, during my early school years, uh, the boys who came from farmers' families, they boasted that, well, you can't do the agriculture because you are not born in a farmer's family. But we, since we are born with the knowledge uh, of the farmers, therefore they are only, uh, they are only the people who can do the agriculture. Now I think this is no more true. Anybody can get into agriculture and do a good job. Now, if we look at the pre-green revolution, then at that time, traditional agriculture involved very low use of technology. As I said, most of the things which uh, they inherited from their fathers and forefathers, only that was being made use of. But the post-green revolution era saw the modernization of traditional agriculture through the use of improved seeds, chemical fertilizers, irrigation, plant protection, and mechanization. In fact, mechanization has permitted conservation of resources such as time and money, and the production of higher quantity and quality has been made possible. Modern agriculture provides protection to the crop from climatic uncertainties to some extent. Looking at the constraints of open field agriculture, local climate together with its uncertainty determines the quality and quantity of the produce. If uh, there are bad weather incidences, then certainly we lose the productivity. Most of the production is terrestrial. That means we have to have land to have the production of the crops, not enough control over insect and pest attacks because we are open, I mean, our borders of the farms are porous. 
and productivities are limited on account of natural vagaries, plant protection, pollution, level of mechanization and input resource uncertainties. Sometimes you get fertilizers and the right kind of um, pesticides, but uh, there are times when you don't get enough of them. There are certain socio-economic trends that we are very much familiar with. Let us agree that there has been tremendous advancements in science, engineering, and technologies. There is an expanding urban sector and consequent attraction of rural youth to cities. In fact, it is claimed that by 2050, two-thirds of this world would be living in cities. There is economic growth with the promise of remunerative and respectable livelihood in urban areas. There is increasing demand for food for urban dwellers and for this is one of the serious concerns which takes us to urban farming and all those kind of options. Making agriculture environmentally sustainable, agriculture today is really blamed for global warming and all other um, the warming of the planet. There is low profitability high drudgery and uncertainties, forcing rural youth to shun agriculture in favor of um, jobs in the urban sector. Therefore, the rationale for seeking better agricultural models has arisen. Rapidly increasing world population, urbanization and aging. Diverse trends in economic growth, family incomes, agricultural investment, and economic inequality. We have been talking about the uh, inclusiveness of growth, but actually we are not getting there. There are reasons. I mean, it's not such a simple um, proposition. So the economic in inequality continues. Greatly increased competition for natural resources. We are blamed for using almost 70% of the uh, potable water for agriculture, leaving very little for industrial and domestic use. Climate change impacts from extreme weather effects, droughts, floods, crop diseases, etc. And of course, we have been talking of total factor productivity and all those kind of things. So plateauing of agricultural productivity for many crops and animals. Transboundary pests and diseases are not uncommon. So based on all this, we can imagine something about the future. As I just said a minute ago, by 2050, two thirds of the planet's projected 9.7 billion people will be living in cities. And between now and 250, at least 1.3 billion people will migrate or will be migrating from villages to city. Left behind in the villages will be only those too old to move and the indigenous people determined to stay. Unavailability of farmland to cater to the exploiting fresh food demands from the growing middle class population of urban Delhi or urban cities. So these are the scenes of future and we, our agriculture has to uh, meet the expectations of this future scenario. If we look at the traditional or the open field agriculture, most of the um, inputs are of the cyclic nature. As you can see here, uh, the trend, for example, irrigation is simplest to uh, imagine. We irrigate it at some point. So this is the upper limit. We have too much water in the field anyway, because we cannot do it all the time. So we sort of bring the field to saturation. Then it goes through the drying up and hits the bottom where the, there's very little water for the crop. And then again, we raise it to a very high level. So this is how it goes on. It's like, uh, imagining that you are being offered four glasses of water in the morning to drink 
and you really uh, can't do that. But then you are starved or you are made thirsty till 2 p.m. in the afternoon and then you are given two glasses of water again. So you can see both the upper limit and the lower limit are not congenial for plant growth. And this happens not only for water, but it happens for the fertilizers, it happens for the temperatures, humidity, everything. And even sunlight, because there is no sunlight during night, there is too much during summer, there is too little in the winters. All those kinds of things are there, with the result that the overall productivity in the field suffers. Better, better it would have been to have all these levels uh, at the optimum, at the middle level, and then uh, we would have uh, improved our productivity. And this is what we try to achieve using precision farming and other modern techniques of farming. So our objective is to optimize the productivity of the crops and other agricultural systems. And to achieve this, uh, we have been making efforts and what follows is some of those uh, technologies which we have been using. So we talk about the protected cultivation, application of a wide range of new and emerging controlled environment agriculture technologies in agriculture with a view to enhance the duration of availability of the production. Then um, productivity increase and sustainability in the intended com commodity. So if you're talking about vegetables, we extend the avail availability of the vegetables, we increase the production, we increase the productivity of vegetables, sustainability, and then make it available around the year almost. If it if if, it, if the market demands it. So when we talk about the basket of technologies in the protected cultivation, it starts with wind breaks. Now wind breaks, uh, mostly we talk about the natural wind breaks, but then today we can have uh, man-made wind breaks as well. So farmstead wind breaks protect homes, barns and greenhouses from heavy winds. Wind breaks should be established to run across the major wind direction. Keep wind breaks at least 30 meters from the plastic culture areas. Design factors are location, density, height, height of the crop, width, length, spacing, and tree species. So depending upon these, these factors, we can have right kind of wind breaks. How it helps? So look at this tree on the left hand side. And as the height of this tree is important, the heavy winds on the upstream side, they are deflected. And the in the wake of this tree, we have very comfortable wind velocities and we avoid the uh, failure of the structures in this area. And you can see, if uh, X is the height of the tree, then downstream at 1X, 2X, 3X, 4X, 5X, how the wind velocities may vary before they become uh, equal to the upstream value. So this is how we protect using the wind breaks, the entire structure. Then the second promising technology has been Cloches. Uh, it's a French word. It literally means bell shaped glass covers. And in the 19th century France, entire fields of plants would be protected with cloches, especially close to Paris, because Paris demanded some of those um, off season vegetables and flowers. A cloche acts as a solar collector, leading to soil warming in the spring by up to 10 degrees Celsius, which helps seeds to germinate either 
earlier than usual by 10 to 14 days, increase the length of the cropping season and make the maximum use of the available ground. Relative humidity under cloches also goes up due to evapotranspiration and lack of ventilation. Carbon dioxide deficiency under cloches has been a problem during sunshine periods because plants quickly consume the carbon dioxide which is available in the cloche and then there is a uh, lack of it. Provision of some ventilation is therefore necessary during sunshine hours to help to moderate the temperature, humidity and carbon dioxide within the cloches. Some of the common shapes, as you can imagine, uh, it's a bell-shaped bell uh, structure uh, of different shapes depending upon the uh, individual liking. So these uh, cloches have helped in making the off-season vegetables and flowers available. As you can see, a cloche has a frame of wood, metal or rigid plastic material which is suitably covered with glass or plastic sheets or film to create a physical barrier between the ambient and the enclosed space while allowing desired quality and quantity of sunshine as well as air exchange. So all these things are permissible by properly selecting or designing the cloche. There are issues as we have seen while discussing, while, while we have weather protection using it and we protect the plants from pests and diseases also. We are able to overwinter and ripen crops at the end of the season. Humidity and watering poses a problem. Weeds is a problem which we have to handle using manual weeding. And then pollination problems because we are covering them with cloches. The bees and other pollinating agents are not easy, easily reaching the flowers. Then mulching. Mulching you are very much familiar because that is being used very extensively. Plastic mulch, mulch is a sheeting of low or high density polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride or polypropylene. And basically we try to cover the strips of the soil in this field. Mulch has the ability to increase crop production by regulating soil temperature, maintaining soil moisture, influencing soil microorganisms, controlling weed growth, and enhancing carbon dioxide levels near plant canopy. An ideal mulch is economical, readily available, and easily applied and removed. Removal of mulch is also equally important. It stays in place well and supplies organic matter to the soil, yet is free of uh, weeds, insects, and diseases. Then another technology is floating row covers. So basically you have a continuous film or textiles material to protect the plants. Floating row covers is a lightweight, non-woven fabric made from spun bonded polyester or polypropylene. It is draped over the plants to enclose them, especially the lettuce and those kind of leafy vegetables. In, I mean, we can enclose them individually or rows or groups. The floating row cover is secured to the ground with pins, boards, bricks, sandbags, rocks, or whatever is locally available. The cover sort of floats directly on the top of the crop, and that's how the name, floating cover. The growing plants push the cover up, and if there is enough slack, uh, it is possible. Alternatively, simple frames could be used to support a FRC above your plants. Basically, what we have seen is that air, sunlight, and water are available uh, to the plants, and uh, FRCs can be very inexpensive and could be utilized two to three times. So that's how their use can be multiplied. Frost can be very easily protected using the floating covers. More rapid plant establishment and growth in the spring 
and fall due to increased temperature and humidity under the cover. The floating covers create a shield around plants to keep the insects and pests away. The materials used for floating row covers could be either lightweight, that's around 15 to 20 grams per square meter, or it could be heavyweight, that means 40 to 60 grams per square meter. GSM is for grams per square meter. Experiences have been pretty good. Weeds grow, but then weeds grow faster and the floating row covers. Therefore, FRC is pulled back to hand, pull or hoe out weeds. Alternatively, plastic or organic mulch could be laid before installing the FRC. So it could be a combination, mulching plus floating row cover. What, watering of the plants could be carried out through FRC because they are porous. If it is laid directly on the crops, if using a frame to support FRC, it is better to lift it to water around plants or use drip irrigation or a soaker hose. Simply lift the cover back to harvest and replace the plants to, continuous, to continue protecting your plants. Insects can get trapped under FRC, especially the aphids, whitefly, mites and thrips. Pests that overwinter in the soil near host plants could emerge the following spring under the cover that we should take care. FRC can abrade and endure stems and foliage during windy weather because of the friction. Temperature under the FRC can increase considerably, that's 3 to 8 degrees Celsius above outside. In case of squash family, remove the FRC for better results. This is the kind of material which is a non-woven um, plastic fabric, uh, which can be used as a floating row cover. Then you have low tunnels, which you are very much familiar with. Low tunnels are used to increase the temperature around seedlings and transplants to facilitate their establishment. And very good use has been made in uh, growing seedlings. Wire hoops can be used as the support system. With the use of low tunnels, the soil temperatures can be increased. So as to get the advantage during winters. Row covers also provide protection from wind, cold air temperatures and pests. Also the hail sometimes. High humidity and poor air circulation under or through the plastic cover may encourage algae growth on the soil and the development of foliar diseases. So provision of some kind of ventilation is very good. Transparent polyethylene with or without perforations and fine nets are usually the covering materials used in this application. Now coming to the greenhouse, that is the upper end application of protected cultivation. Let us first of all define it. A greenhouse is a framed or inflated structure. Inflated structures don't require frames and today's technology permits the construction or establishment of inflated greenhouses, in which crops could be grown under the conditions of at least partially controlled environment, and which is large enough to permit a person to work within it to carry out cultural operations. So in this sense, greenhouses are different from low tunnels. If you look at the geom geometrical shape, both may look alike. But in greenhouses, you are able to enter into the structure and carry out the cultural operations. Major greenhouse users in the world. China is possibly the largest user of greenhouse technology. And conservatively, the area under greenhouses, all, sort of, all types of greenhouses is 600,000 or 6 lakh hectares. Netherlands is the most sophisticated greenhouse country, but the total area in Netherlands is not more than 9,000 or 10,000 hectares, half of which is 
for vegetables and remaining half for flowers. Japan has also been a traditional greenhouse country with almost 66,000 hectares. South Korea has recently joined the ranks with 52,000. In fact, they say in South Korea more than 30% vegetables in the market, they come from greenhouses. Spain, 54,000, Italy, 26,000, Turkey has again moved very fast in this area, 65,000. Our country doesn't really appear in this range, in this table because we even today don't have more than 5,000 hectares under greenhouses. And mostly they are high tunnels. Look at the sea of greenhouses in Almeria, Spain. Uh, it's like um, uh, Dharavi in Mumbai. Uh, all the greenhouses joining the walls and leaving nothing um, open. You simply have some passages to move from one greenhouse to another greenhouse, but it, the entire area is covered with simple structures and doing a wonderful job of growing vegetables, essentially vegetables. Now, what are the uses that we have been making of the greenhouses in this country. And I, I'm just going to list them out. Successful nurseries from seeds or by vegetative propagation, then multiplication of planting material under inclement climatic conditions, especially the uh, biotechnological material. Greenhouse facility could be used <coughs> for round the year cultivation to meet the planting material demands. And high value and high quality planting material. Allow me to drink some water. So high value and high quality planting material could be grown for domestic as well as export markets. Manipulation of microclimate and insect proof features of the greenhouse for plant breeding and thus the evolution of new varieties and production of seeds, especially the hybrid seeds. More self-employment opportunities for educated youth on farm. Income from small land holdings increased several fold. In fact, there have been hundreds of examples where from 1,000 square meter or 0.1 hectare, a family is able to earn about 500,000 or 5 lakh rupees per annum pure income. So the basic design considerations for greenhouses, light transmission, crops that should be grown, size of operation, whether retail or wholesale, environment control requirements, frame material, glazing material, these are all considerations when we seek um, proper design of the greenhouses. This one greenhouse, one of uh, my students, now Dr. Mathala Juliet, who is working in Goa, she designed as part of her doctoral thesis, where she incorporated several features of the energy conserving greenhouse. And it also involves storing solar energy during day and then using it during the night time. With this type of greenhouse, you are able to reduce the heating requirement to almost 10 to 15 percent. And that 10 to 15 percent could be easily made through the storage of the solar energy during the daytime. So this greenhouse was targeted at um, cold desert areas like the Lake. Uh, and similar attempts have been made at different places throughout the world to design such greenhouses. So that means greenhouse energy conservation is possible to the extent of 100% and whatever little is remaining can be met through the renewable energy sources. Look at this uh, large greenhouse range where leafy vegetables are being cultivated very neatly in a professional method and almost all the operations are automatic. 
we have been talking about indoor and vertical farms, which is possible using the greenhouse technology and um, some very large vertical farms are coming up throughout the world today using the latest technologies for lighting, for hydroponics, aeroponics, all those kinds of uh, features it is possible. Fundamental, so what are the fundamentals of hydroponic plant growing system? Like you see in this um, adjoining figure, what we need is water pump of um, right size, then a distribution system, root environment, whether it is um, sand or it is um, rock wool or it is cocoa peat, whatever. Then the mechanism to collect the excess runoff, recycle the collected uh, nutrients, then nutrient storage tank, then controls and sensors to make the whole operation autonomous. Let us see what we have achieved so far. How the changes in protected cultivation technology in an industry has moved. For example, in USA, 50 years ago when I was a student, I was a student uh, almost 45 years ago, we were moving towards modern protected cultivation and soilless culture production practices. We are more concerned with energy conservation because the oil from the the fossil fuel, fossil fuel had become scarce and expensive. 20 years ago, that's around the turn of the century, we were more concerned with meeting market demands for consistent, safe, high quality food and ornamentals year round. Today, we are talking about protected cultivation and soilless culture, that is hydroponics, established as a part of the production agriculture. So it's getting more and more integrated with the overall production ecosystem. What about the future? In future, we are looking at the sustainable plant production systems for sustainable or substantial business development integrated in food chain. And that's why the current youth is inclined to adopt this technology because it gives them enough opportunity for innovation, uh, high income, and overall satisfaction. Look at the greenhouse uh, environment control, especially the heating. When I was a student at Cornell, the heating cost was something like this, 99 liters per square meter per annum. You can imagine it's a huge amount of fuel, but we were using at that time single span greenhouses or the what we say freestanding greenhouses with single glazing. And as you can see, with additional technologies being made available, today we are at 11 liters per square meter per annum level. Nine times reduction has happened during the last. 40 or 50 years. So today what we are doing, we are using multi-span greenhouses, we are using double film. Instead of single plastic film, we are using double film with floor heating and heat um, curtains. So we are using curtains during the night to preserve the heat. We are using floor heating using the solar heated water and uh, greenhouses are multi-span generally with double inflated plastic fill. And that's how 99 to 11 liter progress has occurred. So looking at the sustainability, environmental sustainability, which is not possible with the open field cultivation. We have zero erosion base when we talk about protected cultivation. Soil conservation practices eliminate erosion around greenhouse, enclosures, structures, crops are grown within containers, or even if they are in soils, uh, there is no runoff or there is no loss of soil from the greenhouses. 
there is zero nutrient runoff. All plant nutrients applied to the crops are contained, recycled, or reused. In fact, there are very strict um, uh, regulations in Netherlands to ensure that it is zero nutrient runoff. Zero pesticides. We, we have pest control using IPM without need for chemical pesticides and therefore the produce is of very high quality. Zero herbicides, weed control by exclusion with no need for chemical weed killers. Eliminates soil borne diseases. And so you can look at the uh, attributes of controlled environment agriculture protective cultivation in terms of environmental sustainability. Look at these figures. Total water footprint of tomato production. You can see total water footprint of tomato production in terms of gallons per pound. And this data is already a decade old. In Netherlands, it requires 1.1 gallon per pound of tomatoes. In the US, it requires 15.2 gallons, almost uh, 15 times or 14 times. Global average for this kind of technology is 25.6 gallons per pound. In China, it is 34. So you can see, in China, I think in India, it would be more close to 50 gallons per pound. So you can see the kind of conservation of water which is possible through the protected cultivation. Let us look at some more figures in lettuce cultivation. Lettuce cultivation in the open, we use 600 to 1800 liters per head. And this head is of uh, not very large size, it's two pounds per head. And whereas in greenhouses, uh, it is only 4 to 5.5 liters per head. So you can see uh, the order of magnitude reduction in the amount of water that is used for production of food crops. Land used, again, in the open field you have say 41 tons per hectare per year as the yield of the good quality lettuce. But in greenhouses, it is uh, 10 times more, 420 tons per hectare per year. You can take multiple crops and each crop you have more productivity and that's how you are able to produce much more from a smaller area. So this kind of resource conservation is possible. Ultimately, we can say that with protected cultivation, we have water use efficiency, we have high production and yields, better nutrient management, higher solar energy utilization, both in terms of uh, meeting its energy requirements, as well as improving the photosynthetic efficiency of the plants. Then the quality control is there. We are able to use the IPM and uh, the produce is uh, more juicy, fresh, and um, better appealing to the consumers. There are variants of protected cultivation which have come up very recently. And so we should be aware of that. Protected cultivation is not only mulching, low tunnel and simple greenhouses, but now we are talking about um, inflated structures where crop microclimate is uh, permissible to be uh, practiced or controlled uh, at a very, uh, very economic level. Vertical farming is possible, which is the application of greenhouse technology for large scale food production and multi floor structures to achieve rapid growth and plant production through efficiently managing nutrient solution of crops and the growth using such techniques as hydroponics and aeroponics. So, especially in metropolitans like Mumbai and Delhi, the fresh vegetables and fruits, they, whether they go bad in quality and a uh, lot of losses occur during the, in the supply chain from the production to the supply side. 
whereas in vertical farming, the, these things will be produced right in the middle of the city and made available to the residents. Plant factories, <clears throat> in fact, this concept of plant factories is so common in Japan, but now worldwide, we are talking about it so that we are able to produce the maximum amount from minimum resources. Greenhouse energy sustainability, exploring the utilization of solar, wind and biomass energy systems for sustainability and environmental safety. And it is achievable, it has been achieved and more is being done. In fact, in European Union, they expect that the greenhouses would be uh, self-sustaining in terms of energy and would have zero carbon footprint in um, about a decade. Smart management of natural ventilation under specific exterior conditions is an effective approach for manipulating the environment so as to improve productivity and increase the output. And compared to the wet bed and fan systems, fogging systems have shown to be more suitable under the conditions of anti-insect screens. Different combinations are being made possible. Look at this smart greenhouse with IoT based monitoring and control. And this is the kind of thing which you and you say is, you may be holidaying in Andaman Nicobar, but still every day you are able to keep watch on what is happening in your greenhouse range, who is working, who is not working, and is there any problem which is in, in, which is going to occur. So all that is possible now with remote access to the production facility. High-tech agri-cubes for personal food production, like you have um, fish uh, or aquariums in your living room, uh, you could think of having an agri-cube in your living space. So this is also called zero area food production because you are not really requiring any specific uh, zone for production. It shares the space with you and the other habitants of the location. Vertical farming, uh, this is of course an imagination, but it's quite possible that um, your living space, the living quarters are accompanied by the growing space uh, in these kinds of multi-story structures where the power comes from the uh, reuse of the wastage from the city from where biogas is produced and this biogas is converted into power. All those kind of things, you can have solar panels for... In fact, already we have the technology where the greenhouse uh, glazing produces PV light as well as um, it transmits light for the photosynthesis. We're talking about rooftop production facilities, so if you have independent house, you can as well have a greenhouse on the top, uh, grow your own herbs, leafy vegetables, uh, tomato, etc. Vertical farms 2.0, that means you build these farms in a modular fashion to grow food for, to, uh, for, the, for yourself as well as for the neighbors. So these are basically assembly, disassembly, friendly, you can add floors to it, you can reduce the floors to from this. Non-permanent structure, it's movable, can load diverse growing system apps, own an exclusive operation, lease of module spaces. You can, I mean, you could lease a, like an apartment space here and grow your own food. Lease to entrepreneurs, individuals, community groups, schools. So that is possible. Each school, um, there could be ten different individuals who would like to grow ten different things in uh, different modules. So all that is possible in Vertical Farm 2.0. Underground farming, lighting is no more a constraint because we can generate excellent quality light using LEDs. So the practice of growing food underground is possible, where the temperature remains almost constant throughout the year. 
This agricultural activity takes advantage of the controlled environment agriculture technologies in full, aims at creating stable underground environments where food is grown in constant, predictable and sustainable ways. People have used their basements for growing food. The tunnels, abandoned tunnels, they can be used for food production and there are different possibilities. Even in fact, you can go under water to grow foods. So these are benefits of underground food production. I think I can, I can quickly uh, move away from this. All those benefits are listed here. Provision of light for food production in underground spaces. Let us realize that photosynthesis uses only 6% of the available sunlight. Solar optics, which employs stamped plastic fresnel optical lenses, which track the sun optically and direct sunlight deep into the interior. That technology is available. Another product of recent technology, photovoltaics, that is a means of converting light directly into electrical energy and then reconverting the PV electricity into light in conjunction with light emitting diodes. That is very effective and it's possible. Growing underground, there have been several examples. I just indicated a few of them. Aero Farms, New Jersey is one such uh, large application. Uh, leafy greens nurtured under multicolored LEDs. Then there have been recent greenhouse innovations, intelligent automation, that means uh, the ho whole greenhouse facility is made autonomous, self-sufficient water systems, so you are recycling water to the extent that uh, very little is required from outside, optimized lighting levels, cooling technology, strategic shading, combined heat and power systems, renewable energy supply systems, all that is possible now. Globally, greenhouses are now expected to meet local consumer needs. In fact, that is what is um, being analyzed. I remember when I was a student, uh, there was very little being produced in New York State because of the uh, severe winter and the fresh fruits and vegetables being, were being imported from Florida, Mexico, California. And of course, that adds to the food miles and uh, there is quality deterioration no matter how well you store them. So now, same is going to happen in the urban areas. People, they want fresh vegetables, fruits, herbs. So globally, the greenhouses currently produce nearly 350 billion worth of vegetables to meet the local demands. Of course, some of them uh, are so big that uh, they supply to the entire country. Some uh, vegetable greenhouse ranges in Arizona, they supply the cherry tomatoes and capsicum throughout the country. The local food market in the US alone has grown from 5 billion annually in 2008 to 20 billion uh, in recent years and then it is going to further improve. The safety of CEA, that is Control Environment Agriculture, combined with a short transparent supply chain is exactly what consumers, customers and industry needs. For example, in Saudi Arabia, where greenhouses are being increasingly encouraged as a way to achieve regional food security and reduce the stresses on local water resources. Look at this inflatable membrane greenhouse. There's no frame here. It is only the air uh, which keeps the whole structure in position and you grow whatever crops you want to grow. And of course, economics uh, depends on the type of commodity that we are growing and the technology which we are using. But what I am uh, stressing upon is that the technologies are becoming more and more affordable as we move on. Look at the air inflated greenhouses, uh, which could be sort of uh, 
technology for moon and Mars and deserts, uh, and uh, it doesn't require any uh, steel structure or even structure, it's simply inflated frame. Such greenhouses have made food production in deserts easier. Underwater greenhouses, and um, I have always thought that uh, we can have large greenhouses on the ocean floor because again, at that depth, the temperatures are comfortable and uh, constant throughout the year. Lighting is, uh, it can be transported from the uh, ocean surface or we could have LED lights to meet the requirement of the photosynthesis. And that way we can increase the total area under cultivation. So we can have greenhouses or protected cultivation anywhere, underwater, terrestrial, in the air, and uh, on high mountains. So uh, food production does not have to depend entirely on the terrestrial um, land resources. Then you have geoponics. Another interesting thing where our life is made easier. A synthetic super soil loaded with zeolite minerals. It contains essential plant-loving growth nutrients. The plants are actually self-regulating. They take what they need and when they need. Adding only water, plants grow in the synthetic super soil for several growth cycles. So we don't have to worry about the balancing the nutrients and uh, you only need to circulate the water to maintain proper uh, concentration of oxygen and other gases. So this technique, which is now named as geoponics, can become part of the overall protected cultivation practices. One question everyone asks is the biodegradability of the films, plastic films that we have been using. And of course, there are recycling options, but then uh, biodegradable films are also being developed and uh, they are there. So the biodegradable mulching films, uh, if they have to be competitive, alternative to polyethylene mulch, then we, we need to have uh, these biodegradable materials maintain a conducive microclimate, be flexible to allow mechanical installation, so they should have enough strength, remain intact during the majority of the cropping season. If they have to degrade, they should degrade after the crop is over. Undergo complete degradation after soil incorporation or composting. Have no adverse impact on the environment and be economical. So these are the attributes that we are expecting in these biodegradable films, which are being developed. Used plastic management. Basically, we look at the source reduction, energy recovery, thermal decomposition, integrated approach. Landfills is really the last option. Biodegradable plastics. And then recently, we have microbial and enzymatic degradation of used plastics. Uh, which can give us very sustainable options. So the overall question of uh, plastics creating pollution is going to be addressed very effectively using these options. So these plastics which uh, really created a panic uh, some 20 years ago have uh, led to various developments and today uh, we can talk about the recycling process, which is uh, very much uh, in place in some countries like China. So you can have recycled products from the plastics which have come from the field. And of course, ultimately we are looking at the world as uh, practicing sustainable agriculture using intelligence and uh, weather data. So we are talking about big data plus artificial intelligence plus machine learning, and it gives us uh, very predictable food production in the world. 
and we have a very bright and green vision of this planet Earth where uh, there's nothing really which is uh, polluting this uh, planet. Uh, food production should become an integrated approach of the entire uh, society where we are producing fish, animals, and the material from one is going to the other. So, and today we are talking about circular economy. So we can't afford to generate uh, pollutants or residues, byproducts. They should all be useful and become part of the economy, overall economy. So to conclude my talk, as the global population continues to grow and resources like land, water and labor become more restricted, protected cultivation and such similar options will be a dominant contributor for feeding global population just as important as the open field production. Open field production is not going to disappear. <coughs> Only thing is that some of it will get converted to so some of the area under open field cultivation will be converted to protected cultivation. Now let us agree that um, protected cultivation in integrated mode has the best possibility of assimilation with circular economy. China has more than 5% of its net zone area under protected cultivation today. India should at least target 1% of the net zone area. That's about uh, 1.5 million hectares under protected cultivation. What we need to do is to uh, sort of redesign our education, R&D, skilling and financial incentivization for intensification and strengthening of the protected cultivation practices in this country. And uh, by using the protected cultivation, we would have uh, provided 10 million highly uh, productivity linked uh, employment to improve the lives of our, our country people. So with this, let me once again thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my views with the uh, audience, very learned audience. And if there are some questions or comments, we can certainly deliberate upon them. So with this, I am stop, stopping the presentation part. Okay, uh, am I uh, visible now? Okay. Yes, sir. So the Hello. yeah, the floor is now yours, Dr. Kalia. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Shivangi. Hello. Yes, sir. Shivangi. Yes, sir. Uh, display if there is any question or something like that. Sir, we have some appreciation and there are no questions as of now. Oh, really? <laughs> and display. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think I took almost an hour. Not yes, sir. It was, nice, uh, it was nicely managed time, sir. Anu Verma, good morning, sir. I agree this. Sir, this uh, technique will definitely help us to achieve the target, but still its initial investment and its maintenance is a big drawback to adopt this technology. No, I agree with uh, Anu Verma. And uh, yeah. as I said, people like you who get into this business of protected cultivation would bring about the economy and uh, the maintainability. As I said, skills is a big problem. Unless yes, we have that skills, we lose the uh, entire charm of this technology. Sir. Any other, Shivangi? Indra Bhushan Maurya. 
how can we reduce humidity during a rainy season as it is a big problem in Rajasthan in getting good fruit setting? True, the during rainy season, humidity almost approaches saturation. Now, if we if it becomes very critical, we should apply some dehumidification technologies, which are available, of course, yes, expensive, sir. but then you have to look at the overall economics of the production system. So if you can save your crop from high humidity, you certainly should install dehumidification system, and which are available in the market now. So sir. think about it. And yeah. if nothing else, what we can do is we can take this air from the greenhouse through underground pipes. And so what high, uh, this high humidity will uh, lead to condensation in these pipes and then the return air would be uh, having lower humidity. So this is also a possibility using the underground pipes for uh, humidity yeah. reduction. Okay. Any other Shivangi? Uh, no, sir, there are no questions. Okay. Covenant protector cultivation. Congratulations, sir. Any other? No more. No, sir. No. Thank you very much again from my side. Uh, uh, okay, sir. Yeah, sir. Uh, let me uh, do my job first before uh, we finally say thank you to you. Uh, sir, uh, viewers, uh, I think we have had a wonderful talk. Uh, real futuristic uh, talk uh, this was we, that we have uh, today and uh, protected cultivation is a technology uh, which is uh, really for the future as uh, Professor uh, Pitam Chandraji has detailed in uh, in the beginning uh, what why we need it uh, entire setup is explained uh, in a very systematic way uh, with the uh, comparison to open cultivation uh, especially what are the constraints that we are exper experiencing and what are the advantages uh, that uh, protected cultivation uh, through uh, protected cultivation we can have and to meet out the requirement of uh, ever increasing population globally and also movement of uh, the population towards cities in search of jobs and uh, various other requirements and as uh, professor chandra has detailed that uh, by 2050 many 9.7 billion population will be in cities so uh, we have to think today about uh, how to feed them uh, because there won't be any land and uh, uh, the uh, spaces would be less. So how to produce more in a less space uh, and less uh, inputs. So this is the only technology which has bright future. Of course, uh, in the past and present, as Professor Chandra has detailed that uh, there is, uh, there is uh, I mean, uh, open cultivation is not going to be... Uh, uh, done with it is there it will be there but where concentration of population will be there and uh, to manage the input resources uh, uh, the, which are depleting and as population increasing we have to look for these technology and over the years initially when uh, professor chandra has detailed that uh, in 50 years ago we started thinking on this uh, when it was very costly, but over the years, the technology has been sharpened, modified, made futuristic, uh, smart uh, system uh, are now coming coming up and uh, they are proving best also as uh, the uh, people also uh, get convinced only when they see it. So uh, now the people can see it. Many countries has already uh, gone into, but India always look uh, others uh, how they are doing and then they will start moving so that is the only hitch and uh, towards the end professor chandra has said that uh, we have to make uh, towards one percent of the net cultivation has to be through uh, that we have to ensure i think there will be a lot of movement all those a lot of financial assistance in different states has been uh, given uh, but from the technology front uh, uh, demonstrating on the field there are some lacunas which uh, will be looked into as we move forward and uh, this is an eye opener for the planners uh, the scientists uh, how they can further uh, make uh, this technology more uh, farmers friendly consumers friendly uh, that point of view and a lot of entrepreneurship which has already he has detailed there are a lot of aspects uh, for the new uh, graduates or uh, postgraduates coming up to look into this venture and uh, uh, come up with a lot of uh, 
material availability to the uh, to the farmers especially and also the uh, the quality and the quantity of the produce that he has uh, mentioned and already uh, people are achieving it from different uh, in different areas so that uh, shows uh, the path is very right and there is a bright future for us and we have to go for it so i thank professor chandra for a very nice excellent uh, uh, talk that we have had uh, because he is the right expert as he has explained where he has started from and uh, he is still doing uh, very uh, nicely in this sector and i think we need to uh, use uh, such ex such expertise to educate people and uh, make aware uh, about uh, these uh, new technologies which can help us in uh, getting the right kind of food quality and quantity to our countrymen. So with that, I thank Professor Chandra profusely from the on behalf of uh, BSHF and Professor uh, Brahm Singh Ji, uh, who has uh, uh, requested you to deliver the talk and you have honored. So thank you very much. Thank you once again. And I am grateful to you, Dr. Brahm Singh and the foundation for this opportunity. So now I am logging off. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Shivani. Shivangi. Hello. Yes, sir. Thank yes. you, Shivangi, very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Shalinder wasn't there. Yes. So, uh, uh, and we must uh, uh, tell our viewers, viewers, uh, uh, we are going to be off on next Sunday. So you please be here with us. But next to next Sunday, we'll be there with you, to uh, and we will come up with another uh, talk which will be useful to you. Uh, so join on twenty seventh uh, on Sunday with us for a new talk. And what about uh, that? Uh, mm, That's we'll inform later, sir. We'll, we'll inform about it. We'll put up the brochure on the uh, system later on. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.